Okay. Find the book of Romans, please. I asked Brother Jordan to give me 50 minutes, but there's a reason for it. I wanted to share, oh, by the way, um, for the people online, good morning. If you're online, I don't know how that's working. And my wife sends her love to everyone. She was not able to be here this year. She's not traveling well anymore. So it's hard, all these flights and luggage and oh my goodness. So it's getting harder, you know as the years move on. The reason I asked for 50 minutes is I wanted to share the testimony again. I shared last year at the conference um, at the Holiday Inn about my experience with Grace School of the Bible. And I wanted to share that again because I feel it's that important that when I got the Grace School of the Bible material, I remember that there's a um, specific course called FOD fundamentals of dispensationalism and at that point I was already rightly dividing but I didn't know anything about time past but now ages to come I knew I knew that Hebrews to Revelation were written to Israel after the rapture of the church I had figured that out by reading first Peter 1 13 where Paul t where Peter talked about girding up the loins of your mind that when his grace shall come at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, Peter's speaking to people who are alive at the second coming of Jesus Christ? That was my first awakening in the Word of God in my own personal study that there was something that was not written to me. And that's how I came to understand the Hebrew epistles. were None of them were written to me as I understood my eternal salvation in Christ through Paul's gospel. Well, when I got that, school of the Bible, and I remember it, putting the tape in, and I actually said to myself, I don't know what this guy's going to teach me. I already know how to rightly divide. <laughs> I said that to myself. And then he drew the chart. And for the first time in my life, I saw time pass, but now and ages to come. And I have to tell you that that moment, my life changed. My life changed, for real. I finally understood the Word of God and where everything fit in. Because at that point, the only person I had heard about rightly dividing was a man who taught that the dispensational boundary was Acts 28. And that set me straight of where the dispensational boundary was in Acts chapter 9. So I say that to you that if you have not taken Grace School of the Bible, and I would even encourage families with children, you don't have to take it and, and, and take the classes and, you know, do it for, you know, A, B, C, D, E, or Fs. You don't have to do it for that. You can do it for the personal edification of your own family and sit there on Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night with your children and go through Grace School of the Bible because that's, it's a teaching program and it's built for the, and it's designed for the godly edification of the family. And that's why I'm just sharing that with you today because it changed my life. Although I've never been a student of Grace School of the Bible. I didn't take the course. I got the course and I, you know, I've been through it, but I never took it to, I audited it, I guess that's what they call it. So I just say that to encourage you. Find Romans chapter 6, please. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and our Father, I'm so thankful this morning for the opportunity to open the Word of God, to open a King James Bible and learn and study and understand your word rightly divided. I pray this morning that as we share these words that our hearts will be open, attentive, that this will be a time of refreshing, encouragement, edification, renewing. And I pray all these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
before we look at Romans chapter 6, in Romans 1, 11, Paul, ta Paul says that to the end that ye may be established. He begins the epistle with the concept of being established, and that's what you get when you are in Christ. You are established to begin with. But he ends the epistle in Romans 16, with Romans 16, 25, talking about, now to him that is of power to establish you, not establish you, to establish you. So you're established at the beginning already, but you're established at the end, and what does that mean? Well, you see those gigantic towering TV towers that go up two, 3,000 feet into the air. They rest on foundations that are bigger than this room because they rise so high into the air. Well, if they built that tower and all they did was leave it that way, it would wobble in the wind and eventually it would topple over. So what they do is they run the wires on those towers and you can see the wires and they stabilize the wire, the, uh, the, the tower. And so in the beginning of, Paul, of Romans, you're saved, you're a Christian, you're in Christ. That is established. You have a, fountain, a foundation under you. But you're still wobbly. And you're tossed to and fro by many winds of doctrine. But by the time you get to the end of the book of Romans, you are stabilized. You have an inner equilibrium about you in your Christian life. And when religion sends its blasts against you, you can withstand them. And you can stand fast in the liberty that you have in Jesus Christ. In the same way that we're accustomed to a transition that took place after Saul of Tarsus was saved in Acts chapter 9 and became the mighty apostle to the Gentiles, and there was a transition that took those people from law to grace, which took approximately 30 years. There is a transition that takes place in the book of Romans. And if you're in Romans chapter 6, verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Now, that is the first time in the Word of God that the hint that you could ever possibly live by not sinning so much is even mentioned. That's the first time. Everything that came before is a demonstration of the inability of human beings to live without sin. The law could not, the law could not help you to live without sin. That's what Romans 3, 19 and 20 said. For now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law couldn't stop you from sinning. What the law is, is a mirror that God sent down from heaven with his law on it, and he said, do you look like this? And every one of you had to say, no. And that's exactly what the verse says. And all the world becomes guilty before God, and every mouth is stopped. Stop your boasting. You have nothing to boast about. Be quiet. God says, shut up. You've got nothing to give me. That's what God says. So before you get to Romans 6.12, and Brother Jordan spoke the other night about the purpose of the mystery is to manifest Christ, the life of Christ in us. Amen. That's the purpose of the mystery that we live in today, is to manifest Christ. Well, Romans 6.12 is where you begin manifesting Christ. Let not therefore sin reign in your moral body. That will be part of manifesting Christ. Before you get that, 
There's a transition that has to take place in your understanding. There's something you have to know. And the verses that have been committed unto my trust this morning are serve like the hinge on a door. If you remove the, the hinge off of a door, especially the top one, you ever try to open that door? Well, the verses that we're going to look at this morning serve as the hinge that takes you from knowing that you're in Christ, knowing that you have salvation, knowing that your salvation is secure, knowing that you can't lose it, to let not sin therefore reign. Because that doesn't happen immediately. So look with me this morning. As we begin at Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, and follow along closely with me as I read this verse. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into water, oh, it doesn't say that, right? But people arrive at this passage of Scripture and depending on where they've been educated, depending where they go to church, depending who their pastor is, when they see the word baptism or they see the word baptized, immediately they see water, even if water is not there, because they believe what their pastor teaches them rather than believe what the Bible says. They believe what he says even though he disobeys the only verse in the Bible that tells him how to study his Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. So even though water baptism is the furthest thing from this verse of Scripture, they don't care that they don't see the water there they want water in this passage of Scripture, and by golly, they're going to get dunked in a tub of tap water if it kills them. Because that's what they want. And they're going to use Romans chapter 6 as the reason or the excuse to be buried or to be planted in water because that's what the verse says, that they're buried and planted in water. And they find in these verses the excuse to be dunked in tap water. But the verse says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now you will notice that that verse is a question. And the question is predicated upon something that came before Namely, verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And you will notice that that also is a question predicated upon something that came before it, namely verse 1, which says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I'm sure you're catching on now, right? Another question. And no, we are not going to make our way back to Genesis chapter 1, okay? <laughs> but at this point, at verse 1, many people think that Paul is beginning a new subject as he gets to chapter 6, verse 1. I'm going to tell you why I don't think that's so. I don't think that's what's happening. Verse 1 says, what shall we say then? Say about what? Well, obviously, what he's been talking about in chapter 5. So I submit to you that to proper, properly understand chapter 6, we must understand what Paul was talking about, what he was proving in chapter 5. I mean, chapter 5 is the greatest chapter in the Word of God on the eternal salvation of the person who has trusted and believed in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 proves the absolute, irrevocable, 
never-ending certainty and finality and eternality of the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ and that nothing could ever take it away from you. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, you are justified by faith. There was nothing you could do to save yourself. There was nothing you could add to your salvation. There was nothing you could bring God or bring to God as an acceptable exchange for the free gift of eternal life. The only thing you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary. And you did that very well. And you brought that sin with you to perfection. We all did that. But in Romans 5.1, you are justified by faith. There's nothing you could do to save yourself. Your justification is by faith alone. That resulted in you having peace with God. It gave you access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand, you were able to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then Paul makes that great statement in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, when we had nothing to give God, when there was nothing we could give in exchange for that gift, when we were without strength, without ability, even without desire, to be saved or know God. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And just as a point of interest, in Romans 1.18, Paul said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And in Romans chapter 1, he talks about the ungodly, the heathen, the Gentiles, in chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to Romans 3.20, he talks about the unrighteous Israel. So when he says that Christ died for the ungodly, he's referring to the heathen. He's referring to the Gentiles. If you take out your e-sword or whatever Bible program you use, and you look up the word ungodly, in your King James Bible, the word ungodly from all the way back here to all the way over here is always referring to the heathen. It never refers to Israel. Israel had the law. They disobeyed the law. That made them unrighteous. Is there ungodliness? Yes, there's ungodliness and unrighteousness, but there is a distinction. So when Paul says that in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, that happened here. In due time. In due time. Remember 1 Timothy 2, 2, 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. That Jesus Christ died was a fact, was well known. But when he died here, like Alex said last night, John chapter 11 it was necessary that one man should die for that nation. He died for that nation. But it was testified in due time that he died for the ungodly because he did pay for the sins of all people at all times. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. I don't know, that's not my message. That was been preached already, but Romans 5, 6, you know. And then Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But Paul, is this salvation forever? Is there anything that can take, that can come along and take this salvation away from us? Well, Paul says there's more. Verse 9, much more than 
being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying that if God gave his son while we were yet enemies, if God did the greater thing of saving us while we were aliens and enemies in our minds by wicked works, if God did the greater thing of doing that, then it only stands to reason that surely he's going to do the simple and easy thing of keeping us saved once we're members of the body of Christ, even until the end, and as he puts it in these verses, even from the wrath to come. Now, that's the theme of Romans chapter 5. Then when you get down to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul begins to speak of your union with Christ. You were in Adam, now you're in Christ. Adam did this, Christ did this. Adam sinned and brought death upon all men. Christ died and brought eternal life upon all those who believe. Because of the one act of Adam, death passed upon all men. And because of the one act of Jesus Christ on the cross, eternal life has passed upon all men. We reap the benefits of what Adam did. (laughs) We also reap the benefits of what Jesus Christ did. And then he ends this chapter, Romans chapter 5. And before I read the verse, when you hear the word rain or raining, What do you think of? What comes to your mind? King, queen, authority, royalty, dominion, tyranny. Overpowering, reigning. So Paul ends the chapter, chapter 5, verse 21 that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice that Paul speaks of two spheres of authority. He speaks of the reign of sin, sin reigned, and he also introduces or speaks of the reign of sin, uh, uh, the reign of grace, grace reign. Now, in the reign of sin, death is king. In the reign of grace, eternal life is king. And then as we move into chapter 6, Paul doesn't just stop talking about what he's been talking about. He doesn't just all of a sudden put the brakes on what he's been talking about and start talking about something else. He's been talking about the finality and the certainty and the eternality of the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ. He doesn't just stop that, start something new. He's going on. He's going to continue that. He's going to solidify that in your thinking. He's going to cement that for you. He's going to give you something that you can latch on and hold on to and continue so you can finally get to Romans 6, 12 and understand that in a way that you never could have unless you knew about the hinge that takes you there, that transition that takes you into an understanding of something that you can actually do in your Christian life. Before, as he leaves chapter 5 and he gets into chapter 6, Paul anticipates a question or he foresees an objection. 
But if someone is asking a question, and the person who asks this question is a person who does not yet understand who he is in Christ. He does not understand the position that he has been taken from and put into, so he asks this stupid question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I mean, Paul, more sin, more grace, right? Isn't that what you're saying? Paul answers the question in verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, it's absolutely essential. You can't move forward from here. You cannot move beyond this verse until you understand what those words mean, dead to sin. Now, you will notice what he did not say. Paul did not say that you died to committing sins. Okay, he did not say that. He did not say that you died from committing the act of sins. And the reason I know he didn't say that is as I look around this room this morning, I don't see any halos. Which makes me regret that we've had rubber gloves back here. We've had mirrors back here. And I'd sure love to have a halo because I'm the only one who should be wearing one. Because every way of man is right in his own eyes. I'm joking, all right? Is that mirror still here? Because I'll hold that up and preach to myself, okay? <laughs> But in order to understand our identity in Jesus Christ, it is absolutely essential to understand what the apostle meant when he said that are dead to sin. Ye that are dead to sin. So what makes Christians different than people in the world? And it's not something that you can see. It's not visible. It's this. is that you have been changed from one sphere to another. You have changed kingdoms. So let's look at that. Because this has to do with your identity in Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, Paul was speaking of two different kingdoms. He's thinking, he's talking about the kingdom or the reign of sin, and he's talking about the kingdom or the reign of grace. The kingdom of sin produced death. The kingdom of grace produces eternal life. So the answer to what does it mean for the Christian to have died to sin, or in what sense did a do members of the body of Christ die to sin? The answer is, you died to the reign of sin. You died to the reign and the rule and the dominion of sin over your life. So in chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, I just want to take a quick look at this. Paul is contrasting these two kingdoms, the reign of sin and the reign of grace. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he brought the reign of sin to its knees and abolished that in your life. That's gone. You're out of that. So notice how Paul speaks of this. In Romans 5.18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's the reign of sin. Notice the next part of the verse. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. That's the reign of grace. Then he goes on in verse 19. For as by one man's obe uh, disobedience, many were made sinners, that's the reign of sin. Then the contrast. So by the obedience of one, 
shall many be made righteous. That's the reign of grace. And even, even as he begins to make this comparison, look back at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, that's the reign of sin. That's what the reign of sin produces, and it produces it every time. It is a rule. It cannot be changed. It happens every single time. And the point that Paul is making in chapter 6 is that if you have been justified by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you are in Christ, if that is true of you, then you are finished with that reign. You're dead to the reign and the rule of sin. You are now under the reign of grace and everything that comes with it. So the important question, which will arise in some people's mind, of course, inevitably, is if I'm no longer under the reign of sin, why do I still sin? You have to know and understand that Paul has never said that you became sinless. At this point right here, He's not saying that. And he's not even dealing with that question in Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. What Paul is dealing with is the matter of understanding the difference between your position in Christ and your personal experience. There's a huge difference between those two things. A huge difference between your position and your personal experience. I mean, the position that a person holds is a title. In the company that you work in or work for, there's someone above you who is your boss. He holds that position, whatever they call it. But it's only a position. That person's experience, what he does, may not always reflect that he holds that position. Your boss doesn't always act like your boss. Do you know what I mean? But he is, nevertheless, your boss because that's his position that he has. So Paul, in this juncture, at this point in Romans 6, is concerned mainly about your position and what he has demonstrated in the last nine verses of Romans chapter 5, is that people in this world are either under the reign of sin and that's their position, or they're under the reign of grace through faith in Christ and that's their position. He's talking about and he's concerned about your position. So what he is in fact saying is at one time, we were under the reign of sin in the kingdom of sin, and now we are under the reign of grace in the kingdom of grace, where death hath no more dominion over you. And notice in verse 9 of Romans 6, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. You know, Jesus Christ was born under the reign of sin. He was born in that. I made a point in our church a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 3 where all the people that were ruling, Herod and of Tiberius and blah, 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 the most, the most despicable evil men that ever ruled in the world. And Jesus Christ was born in those days under the reign of sin. He was born in that. When he died, he also died to that. Of course, it never affected him. You know, he was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate. That's what he was. But death hath no more dominion over him, and you, we know what Christ has, we have. And like Brother Jordan said the other night, what we have, he has, which 
should be disappointing for us to know. You know? But in verses six to three, uh, in chapter six, verses three to five, Paul now gives us a visual picture of the spiritual journey that we took out of one kingdom into the other. And I want to look at some scriptural examples of that, of this journey taking place from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of um, the reign of, of sin to the reign of grace. I'm sure there's a verse that comes to your mind right now. As in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that's the reign of sin, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, and that's the reign of grace. And that word translated in Colossians 1.13 means to convey from one place to another. That's what happened in Jesus Christ. That's a beautiful visual picture for us of a spiritual truth that took place. And then also, if you want to follow along in Acts 26, Alex read these verses last night, but I have a different point to bring out of them. Acts 6, 26, 16, this is Paul when he was first commissioned. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. From darkness, the reign of sin, to light, the reign of grace. From the power of Satan, the reign of sin, to the power of God, the reign of grace. Two kingdoms. Two spheres, two individual and separate positions that people have a choice of which one they're going to be in. You have that choice. Another common picture, a, a place where at least I see this distinction, is in Philippians chapter 3, where Paul said, Philippians 3 verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation is in heaven. Some people say, I know everybody disagrees with this, our citizenship is in heaven because it's not there. And I agree. But the idea, the idea of that is kind of there, and I'll tell you why. The next verse, verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. When our bodies are changed, our citizenship will change also. Now, God looks at us now in the body, but he looks at us as though we were already there. We live here, but positionally, we're already there. And this is the point that Paul is making in Romans chapter 6. Okay, we died to sin. We died to the reign and the rule and the dominion of sin. And because of that, the reign of grace is guaranteed to produce certain results. The reign of sin produced results. Death passed upon all men. It gets every single one of us. But the reign of grace is infinitely more powerful. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Oh, it's much greater. So if the reign of sin guarantees certain results, the reign of grace guarantees even bigger and greater and more abounding results than that. What does it guarantee? The most important thing. It guarantees 
that the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ is irrevocable, it is absolute, it is certain, it is final, it is everlasting, it is never ending, it can never change, it can never be taken away from you. The, great, the reign of grace guarantees that for you and to you. Securely. Now here, see, so you're not merely dead to the reign of sin. That's the negative part of this whole thing. You're alive under the reign of grace. The beauty of the reign of grace is that all the power in the reign of grace is available to you. It is working in you. And one day it will bring you to perfection. That's the end result of the reign of grace. So, of course, people again will ask. If I'm no longer under the reign of grace, why do I still sin? And like I'm saying, it's important to keep in mind that at this point in Romans chapter 6, this is a hinge. This is a hinge verse. It's a transition from the fact that you were saved, you're justified, you're in Christ. It's a hinge that takes you to let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Before you get to that hinge of that door of let not sin therefore reign, you have to go through this. You have to understand this. You have to know this. Your position, your identity in Christ, that's what Paul is concerned with in Romans chapter 6, the first six verses. He's not dealing with the issue of sin and the believer yet. That's coming. And that's not the purpose of my message. So I'm going to stay with our identity in Christ. So being in this position, being in this position in this reign of grace, there's a difference with knowing about the position and realizing it and experiencing it. Those are two different things. And let me give you an example. Over 100 years ago, one of the greatest plagues that the United States of America was guilty of was it was against humanity. The South especially was the capital of slavery. In 1861 to 1865 came the Civil War and abolished slavery in the United States. And here's what happened. All the slaves, young and old, were given their freedom and some of them had been slaves all their lives. That was the only life they knew. When their deliverance came, many of them found it difficult to understand that they were now free. They found it difficult to understand this new position that they held. Although they heard the announcement that slavery was over and they were free, thousands of them did not realized the impact that that had on them. When they saw their old masters coming, fear would rise up inside of them for fear of being purchased again and being sold back into slavery. They were free. They weren't slaves anymore. The law had changed. Their position was different, but it took them a very long time to realize it. Because you can be released from slavery legally, but you can still be a slave in your emotions and in your feelings, although your status and your position and your identity have been completely changed. Well, that's how it is in Christianity. That's why from Romans chapter 6, verse 2 to chapter 6, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, there has to be a transition in your understanding. 
you have to understand positionally before you can walk in the experience of it. Because some of you, after you're saved, you still walk like Leroy. <laughs> Rather than walking like who you are in Christ. See, the slaves couldn't believe the announcement about themselves. This can't be true. We can't really be free. And they continued to live with the mentality of slavery dominating them for years and years and years. It took them a long time to believe it and receive it and apply it to themselves. And that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, reckon it, realize it, acknowledge it, impute it to your account, receive it for yourself, live in it, walk in it, apply it. That's what he's saying in, in verse 11. He says, it's true. It's a done deal. I mean, imagine that you lived in the 1500s where there were castles and kingdoms and on one side of a river was one kingdom with its large doors and its high impassable walls and on the other side of the river was another kingdom inside of the kingdom where you were living was a tyrant of a king who labored unceasingly to bring condemnation upon your life to make you feel guilty, to keep you discouraged, and to keep you miserable. You recognize that kingdom? Okay. One day, you found a way over the wall. You swam across the river, and you arrived at the other kingdom. And the doors swung wide open. And to your amazement, Inside of that kingdom, the people were rejoicing and dancing and singing. Even the king was happy and joyful. And there you are. You're standing in the midst of this rejoicing. But it was hard for you to believe that a kingdom like this even existed. After all, the only thing you had ever known was the other side of the river. And so your mind, although you were here, your mind frequently would take you over here and create doubt and fears. And you'd want to participate in some of the habits that you knew so well from the other kingdom. So what... Is, it, are you supposed to do? Reckon. You reckon it. You realize it to be true. It has happened. You're no longer in that old reign of sin. You died to that. That old tyrant. And now, now that you know the truth of Romans 6.2, now that you know what it means, now that you, you have an understanding of two reigns that are present in this world, the reign of sin and the reign of grace, now that you know that, Paul is going to give you a picture of, and a visual picture of the journey you took out of that kingdom into this new one, into this grace Romans 5 begins with this grace wherein ye stand and ends with this grace. And now he's going to explain to you how. Well, first you were taken out of one kingdom and into the other, and this is how it happened. In verses 3 to 6 of Romans 6, Paul is going to tell you, and I have to cut it short because I have a, just a few seconds left. 
Paul is going to tell you that when Jesus Christ died, you died with him. And when he was buried, you were buried with him. And burial is a vivid expression that demonstrates when we bury someone and we cover them with dirt, it validates and it substantiates that everything about their old life is over. It's done. You were buried. That rain that you were in, it's done. It's over. And then you were raised with him. These are not things that are going to happen to you. These are things that have happened to you and that's what paul says in ephesians 2 5 even when we were dead in in sin uh, dead in sins hath quickened us together with christ by grace are you saved and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places we're already there yeah physically that has to happen but positionally it's all done you're no longer where you were. And I close with this. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. That's death. Nevertheless, I live. What happened? You were just crucified with Christ. And then a resurrection took place. Yet I live. Yet not, not I. Not I. But Christ liveth in me. That's a new life. You have a new identity. You even have a new ability. But Christ liveth in me. You've been raised to walk in newness of life. But before you can enjoy and live out Romans 6.12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Before you can do that, you absolutely have to go through the transition in your understanding of your position in Jesus Christ. And once you understand that, you can move forward and begin to manifest Christ in your life. But it doesn't happen till the hinge of Romans 6-2 begins to swing in your life, in your understanding. And then, Ephesians 4, do those things that are pleasing. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, thankful for the Word of God, thankful that the Word of God so clearly demonstrates and explains to us a process in the Christian life whereby we can be pleasing in your sight. I pray, Lord, that the words of these messages will be forged upon the tablets of our heart. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.